Writers, readers, drinkers, lend me your ears and your livers. Welcome to Writers Drinking Whiskey Open Bar, the boozy author panel where we dive deep into the liquor and into the writing topics of today. From writing craft to writing life, pop culture, and the rest, I am your host and resident object lesson, William R. Hensey, and we've got a great panel tonight, so let's make our introductions. I thought it would be fun with this. So we'll go one by one from Dan to Dario to Matt, but if you could maybe introduce yourself, let us know what your favorite place to read or write is. And then we're going to play a little game called, and I had it in front of me, I mentioned it in the pregame, and I'm forgetting, bedside, curbside, or down the aisle. Um, And the three authors are going to do where you have to choose if that's going to be the author and their books on your bedside, the author you're putting on the curb and that's going out with the trash, or the author that you're living with forever is Mark Twain, Ernest Hemingway, and Mary Shelley. So, Dan? Would you like to start us? Okay, so Dan Turner, um, and I'm out here in South Carolina, and uh, my favorite place to write is on the back porch. We have a little uh, back porch, and it's a uh, <clears throat> we have a lot of plants um, in the uh, in the summertime, in the spring everything but the winter we bring them in but it's it's a little oasis of a peace um with a I, I have a little uh a nice little cushion chair out there uh so I can sit out there and we do no landscaping whatsoever in the backyard <laughs> uh, if you if you listen to the the previous uh, episode, uh, Bill, thanks for for doing all this. First of all, but uh, I have three dogs that just muck up everything and they tear up the backyard. So it's just a jungle yard, cascading green everywhere, bamboo, um, junipers. Every you know, there's no. It's just chaos back there. But it gives me a moment of of zen, so I can kind of relax and and just take it all in and and you know, sort of feel like I'm. I'm I'm just sort of sinking into uh, the greater atmosphere of the the backyard jungle. Mm-hmm, so sure. yeah, I can just sink right in there. So that's my my favorite place to to get take the laptop out there or a, a pad and paper and get started. Um, so now am I supposed to do all three of those authors? Yeah, yeah, all that, three of them, and okay. then you bucket them. Who is going to be the bedside? Who is going to be curbside? And who are you walking down the aisle with? Ooh, that is that's this is a tough one. Um, I mean, I, I don't. I'd like to take. Uh, well, I guess I have to go with uh, Mary Shelley. I'm going to have to go with bedside, just because she. <laughs> She seems very hot in an in a in an obscure gothic uh, right. gothic sort of things kind of right. way. She was hanging out with you know with Byron with you know she married uh, to Shelley Percy Shelley. I mean she she just seems like interesting uh, interesting soul to get to know. Yeah. She's got it going on. She's got it going on. Yeah, very attractive. <laughs> I've seen you know the. The old uh, daguerreotype, maybe it's a painting I've seen on the the back of Frankenstein. Very attractive. Oh, yeah, lady. that's true. That's true. Yeah. Not not bad. <laughs> not bad. Um, oh boy, now this is a tough one. I do. I love Twain and Hemingway. So, but I mean, you can't really. I mean, Hemingway said that it all started with all of American literature started with Mark Twain. So. Um, you know, do I take his, his advice or maybe, maybe I kick Hemingway to the curbside. I feel like he belongs. <laughs> he's, he, he's happy out there. He'll, he'll just, he'll pick up a bottle of rum. He'll maybe box a, you know, pay a Cuban boy to, to beat him up or something with some boxing gloves. He'll, you know, get some cats. He'll be okay. And then I'll, I'll, you know, I'll marry Mark Twain. I'd, I'll take him down the aisle. He's a good one. <laughs> yeah. on, the, 
Here it goes. Snazzy dresser. Uh, yeah. The mustache, the the white, uh, the white uh, digs, and the the bolo tie. Can't beat that. Right. So, and not bad, not bad with the words either. So. That this is true. That's important. That's important. That is that's hilarious. What I loved about that is that I was joking with someone on Twitter like last week that I was like, oh no, I want like my heaven is I'm going to go there and I'm going to box Hemingway. Like, and then we'll yes. be best friends because yes. he would like that. Like, I'd he be loves like, it. We're going to fight, and he's going to be like, yes. I love this guy, and I'm like, I love you too, Hemingway. You know? <laughs> it will be strong and true and good. Yeah, <laughs> good night in Paris. We'll do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yes. Love it. Perfect. Awesome. Thanks for that, Dan. So, Dario, <laughs> your your turn. So, introduce yourself. Your favorite, you know, place to read or write, and then the same game. So, um, I'm Dario Ciriello. I I write nonfiction and fiction. I have two novels out. Um, I'm struggling with a third, which I may just put by the curbside. Um, <laughs> And uh, I've been a freelance editor as well for the last 12 or 14 years, so I do a fair amount of that. Um, and I live in Michigan. I used to be Bill's neighbor for a near neighbor. Anyway, we were five five or ten miles apart. L.A. accounts as uh, being a neighbor. Right? Yeah. I mean, Matt is my neighbor. And how far are we, Matt? Like 45 minutes. So we're yeah, neighbors. So. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. five or yeah. ten miles. Yeah, it could be two hours in L.A. Oh yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, anyway, I'm in Michigan now, and there's snow outside, and it's way too deep to write in the back porch. Um, but I I write in my office. I like my little office, which is where I am now. Different camera angle. And um, favorite place to read is uh, on a chair in the living room. Um, the house is pretty quiet, so I don't get disturbed. But um, I do like to write in my office. Um, but the game now you you have to clear my confusion here, Bill. Um, is bedside or aisle better? Well, so I'm aisle is clear on the marrying. difference. No, the aisle you're marrying. That's that's, that's what the I writer thought. you okay, get in their certain. books. You get for life. That side is a night, right? You got one okay. night with that that's writer. What I one book with that writer. Yeah. Okay, so um. Curb boy Hemingway was there before you even asked. I dislike <laughs> Hemingway intensely. Um, and I make no bones about it. And I've lost friends over that. Some people <laughs> very no, seriously. One sure. yeah, we won't go there. Um <laughs> Shelley bedside for sure. I can't do that too often, but she was good, and I like the whole Byron crowd. Did you know that? Frankenstein probably wouldn't have been written had it not been for, was it Krakatoa that blew up in 1815 and caused the year without a summer? And Byron and Shelley's party was, um, they were holidaying in Switzerland, I think, and they couldn't go out because it was so cold and nasty. And they ended up indoors writing and, you know, playing cards because they, they were having such a miserable time. So Frankenstein may not have been written had it not been for a volcano. Oh, sure. Not many people Guess know not. that, as my well, Yeah, I did not know that. That's fascinating. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I love Mark Twain. He's one of my very few idols. I think he's exceptional. I'd marry him in a heartbeat. I don't know how he'd feel about <laughs> that. Um, I'm sure he'd write reams about it and probably probably be very annoyed. But um, love the guy. Um I actually got to read, the, they've only published volume one, some of his autobiography not long ago, which is um, remarkable. His collected works, rather, I should say. And uh, I'm waiting for volume two. But, um, man, Life on the Mississippi, what a great book. Mm -hmm, so, sure. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for that. For Matt, on to you. My name is Matthew Kaye, um, the author of seven books. My uh, last uh, story collection came out just last month, so it's kind of a fun time for that. It's called Forest for the Trees, and I'm doing press. And actually, Bill is uh, leading the launch at uh, Skylight Books here in L.A. Um, in a few weeks, so that's kind of exciting times. Um, let's see here. I am going to marry Shelley. 
uh, because she's compassionate with monsters. And, uh, oh, very good. I feel like this could be good for me, right? <laughs> um, so that's good. I am going to have a bedside Hemingway because he seems built for the bedside. That's not a stable man. I don't want to be in the long-term <laughs> thing with him. And I'm afraid if I put him on the curb, he won't handle it well. And he mm-hmm. might like either write some sort of uh, manifesto or come after me. I'm just, I'm a little scared. You know, the he hunting. might start a revolution and take yeah, the house the over. hunting like. bothers me. The, I just don't want him like kicking my door down. And I feel like <laughs> as much as I love Twain, I can kick him out and he'll handle it a little more gracefully. He'll have his nice blazer on and he might just go on his merry way. Right. So You'll have some really witty things said about your breakup if it's, yes. you know, yeah. if it's Twain. I think so. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> and just to be gracious, I actually, I was going to go, I was going to marry Shelly, but you, you pulled that one. So I'm going to oh, say okay. I would marry Hemingway because my marriage is mm. basically like a sparring match as it is, you know, mm. and I'm usually losing, um, yeah. which I imagine I probably would lose because I'm, I'm big, but I'm a gentle giant, you know. And, I see, I see. Um, so I would marry Hemingway um, for a night. I'm thinking Twain, actually. I, I think the the being too clever could actually get old. Like I want that for a night. We're gonna we're gonna talk dirty for a night, but at some point, like it gets a little like it's getting it's getting a little cheesy here. If you like Mark, I see. And, and and because of this, because I'm changing a little bit here at the end, Shelley's going to the curb. Um, She'll she'll find other people, you know. She'll she'll be fine. You know? <laughs> it will. But we all married and we all kind of changed it up. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, yeah. Well. <laughs> like sports radio, we're all just yeah. picking different takes for uh, <laughs> seeing what sticks. I, I know it really is. We're just picking yeah. half takes. You know? but that's what you need to do on the radio. Yep, you do. <laughs> yeah, four writers, um, you'll get five opinions. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's very true. This is very true. Yes. Awesome. So let's get to the first question of the night. Um, so this will be on craft and is writing rules, um, quote unquote. And we're going to go with one of the uh, the classics, the show don't tell. So what does show don't tell mean? Um, should writers heed it? And is there reasons to not? not heed it, to ignore it and, and move on. So, um, Dan, maybe we can start with you and then we'll just move on through. Yeah, I mean, you know, generally I I agree with that. And um, you may have, show don't tell, uh, I, I take that as meaning, you know, use imagery, use uh, setting, uh, yeah. character description, you know, all those things uh, at a, at a riser, writer's disposal plot, uh, as opposed to just uh, spinning out uh, narrative exposition, um, that the get get to the the core of what uh, what you want to say beneath the surface, um, rather than having it all hang out on the surface. And I, I think generally that's a good idea. Um, and as you may have noticed, I'm someone who tends to over talk things when I answer these questions, uh, go on uh, a bit long. But so I, I am, you know, garrulous. And as sure. a writer, when I sit down, I tend to have that same issue, you know, overwrite. Uh, and but that's part of my process is over, you know, kind of getting it out out there uh, and then trying to go back and edit and edit. But one of those things I really try to edit out is, you know, trying to over explain things too much and really try to to go back and work in more, you know, more of the uh, clear, precise imagery uh, and and really make the setting work as it symbolically without being, you know, don't want to hit people over the head too much with that. But, sure. you know, in subtle ways, just to, to bring about uh, aspects of the narrative um, right. And I don't so, we just. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. No, uh, no, it's OK. So to paraphrase it a little. So are you saying like the show is more like the spoon feeding the reader what they should think or know uh, versus I, showing it in any other using any other literary device? That, that's what I, I that's how I 
I've in, always interpreted that, that telling is just kind of, you know, putting it out there pretty uh, straightforwardly and, uh, you know, spoon feeding it with, whereas showing is letting the reader uh, kind of decode uh, the, the keys in the text for themselves. And, you know, we were just uh, talking about four various views on, on old Hemingway, but he did have that iceberg theory, um, you know, which, which is an extreme nope. version of, of the, you know, show, don't tell, don't, you know, tell them almost nothing. Uh, everything is going to be beneath the surface. That might be, that's taking it to an extreme so that, you know, some of us want to kick him to the curb, but, but I think, you know, the, the basic idea there is, is probably a good one. And uh, one I try to follow, um, I will say as a, you know, when I, I, I write poetry, I'm, I sometimes go the other direction because I'm, I think there, the pull is just to write the image. And then, you you know, it, it's good to have a narrative structure and more telling sometimes in poetry because you sometimes a poem can just be a, a line of a string of images and then you don't really have much of substance there. So uh, sometimes it can be a, a question of genre. Sure. That makes perfect sense. So, and I apologize if anyone, so Dan, you mentioned the dogs earlier. I have the two chocolate labs and they're literally going <laughs> nuts right now. Like they're literally like very cool over there. Yeah. I don't even know. They're just, they're barking ad nauseum i heard them. i heard everything I, you say i had to mute it because i'm like everyone's just gonna hear these these dogs going nuts and they're gonna think i'm a horrible owner which is true but they're they're just doing just, their own thing yes it is i assume that was at least a couple of my dogs you know just <laughs> i don't even i don't it's it's just uh it's like living in an airport and having planes fly overhead it just it's nothing anymore so <laughs> you just it's get just, so used to it. I just, yeah, it's it's a problem if I don't hear dogs barking uh, constantly. So, yeah, <laughs> it, it, you're making me feel right at home here, Bill. Yeah, yeah very good. That's that's what I aim for. That's yes. what I aim for. So, um, Dario, you want to take it from there? Yeah, um, Daniel, that was a really nuanced and interesting answer. I liked it a lot, and um, and I especially liked your mention of poetry and. Uh, you kind of proved my point that writing rules are only safe for experienced writers. I think show, don't tell is a really dangerous rule for most people. It's kind of like open with action. You know, you give it to a new writer and they they start dramatizing scenes where people are saying hello to one another for 15 minutes. And I think that's the danger. You know, there's, there are narrative exists for a reason and um you know we'd we'd call it it's really story showing um we'd call it story showing if that's all we did but it's storytelling it's called that for a reason i think and i think there are a lot of instances where it's much more efficient and kind to the reader to summarize in narrative um and save the save the showing and the dramatized scenes for for the important parts um the dialogue the crises the planning um not the you know afternoon in between scenes and i see a lot of as an editor i see a lot of uh, new writer manuscripts where they've really um taken the show don't tell um adage to an extreme and they, they dramatize ridiculous things on the other hand you don't want you know you don't want a novel which begins with 10 pages of exposition too so it's tricky i think when we've been writing for a while if we're naturals we get a feel for it the other thing i would add is that what a lot of people even some experienced writers don't maybe they haven't brought it to consciousness is that um interiority or internal dialogue where the you're narrating from the character's internal point of view is way more like showing than telling it's a narrative technique but when you're deep in viewpoint um, with interiority it feels completely like showing and i think that's a real 
um, secret, which a lot of people could use. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. no, I think, that, I think that's a good point. I, I tend to think of it, um, and speaking from the literary point of view, right? Like the book point of view. Um, it would be different for someone writing cinema. Um, but there's the, I tend to think show don't, don't tell gets lumped into dramatize versus narrate. So, and I if you're that. saying dramatize, like you don't need to dramatize everything. Sometimes like narrate is a, is a tool an author can use. So saying, hey, so-and-so likes to brush his teeth at night using Colgate. Tonight, they use something different. You don't necessarily need to go back and show that three scenes ago that they were using Colgate and now they're using X, right? Like you, some of that can be a narration and that's um, information management is something authors are doing all the time, right? Like we're managing, like how much information do I give you? What do you need? What makes sense? You Absolutely. Know? So I think, I think uh, that's an important point. I, 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 you know, as a final comment on that, I'd like to add that um, voice is key. You know, it doesn't matter how much you're telling. If the narrative voice is on, you can get away with murder. So true. Thanks for that, Ari. So, Matt, maybe we can uh, move on over to you. Yeah, you know, everything is, uh, I'm learning a lot just from this uh, discussion because you sometimes, as a writer who's been doing it for a while now, you kind of stop thinking about it. Like Dario says, you kind of get a feel. It's kind of like dancing, right? Everything with, writing is such a delicate dance um you've got so many issues you're working with with dialogue characterization setting plot there's all these big elements and then you're having to kind of weave them all together all the time in a way that makes sense um and the same thing goes with show don't tell it should really be show and tell you know is kind of how <laughs> i think about it because <laughs> you really have to do both and you have to do them both often and well, uh, because right. in stories, a lot of it is blocking and moving characters and making it just so the reader has a very easy time. Whenever I work with younger writers or people who are beginning, I'm always confused. And confusion leads to people putting a book down. Like So right. confusion sometimes comes from someone who's showing constantly. Um, and you just don't need to, right? If I just need to get a character on a bus and <laughs> work, I can say, you know, like Jim waited for the bus. It was running late. Uh. I just it. it does a lot of work for you. And then if something action packed happens in the bus, that's kind of how I tend to look at it is, right. you know, like I'm working to get a character through an arc and at different moments, different parts of the story are just more emotionally impactful. And yeah. those are the areas where I need to be like physiological and get in the character's body and, you know, to sweat form on the on the nape of his neck. And, uh, you know, the heart starts to clip and pound inside the rib cage or whatever it is. OK, those are moments I'm going to linger on a little more. But if I'm truly just trying to drop off these flowers and, and place them on someone's like doormat and it's a quick little just flourish that can be very effective that way. You know, I think of like Madame Bovary opens with Madame Bovary was sad or something of that nature, right? It was like, it's just a sure. very straightforward. And I see that I, I write a lot of uh, kids books. And like, if you show and don't tell on those, you're in trouble because you're trying to hit like a 600 word count for, you know, a picture book. Um, right. And if you start- And an like, audience that may need to be told sometimes. And right? an audience, yeah, I'm writing one right now about a, a number and it's like a very weird story. I won't get into it, but it's very easy. You have to kind of simplify it and get to it right away with like two, three sentences, you know? That's why Once Upon a Time was such a big line with children's books. It just does a lot of heavy lifting for you. Um, you know, now it's obviously a kind of cliche way to open a, a book, but those are things where- they do a lot of work for you. So yeah, that's kind of how I think about it is show and tell and pick your moments, scene, summary. What are we trying to do with each paragraph? Sure. Well, and I think that makes sense. I think one of the things that people get, you know, mistake nowadays a lot is we watch a lot of TV. Well, we watch a lot of movies. Yeah. yeah. 
and it's showing it to us, right? It's coming into our eyeballs all the time, right? But, you know, when, when you're writing something, narrating that, that's one of, that's part of your toolkit. That's, that's what you have. So, you know, um, one of the things I think happens, and I, I see this actually on TV sometimes, that in a book, there could be a, a dramatic scene where someone's wearing a colored dress. And it's the royal family. When they wear the, the color green, that's when they're going to war, right? <laughs> I can narrate that and say, oh, when they wear the color green, that means they're going to war. And I can set that stage, right? And I think with books, and this is the magic of it. Um, and this is what I hate sometimes when they say, oh, books have gone away because of movies. Um, I don't always think that's true. I think books have somewhat subsided to movies because maybe attention span, but also maybe we haven't been writing the greatest books. Um, I think there's a reason we keep reading Mark Twain. I, I mentioned a bunch of writers when we started. Mary Shelley, you know. I mean, it's Hemingway that we read still. Um, maybe we're, as writers, not doing as good as we could have. Um, but you can narrate that. You can say, hey, you know, this is the, the green is their, their color of war. But then if you're doing that in a movie, well, you, you don't get to narrate it. And what happens when people try to take that to literature is now they feel like, oh, I need to have a character say that. Right, I need a character do that. I, I need some action to display that. But it's not you're forgoing one of your gifts. You're forgoing one of your tools. Right? I always look at it as tool. Like my kids always get annoyed with me because I would always say words like, "I don't have any cuss words." I don't like. There's no like, D don't say that. Right? It's I and and they all like literally joke with me because I say words are tools. Use the right ones for the job. Mm -hmm. So if every day you come home and it's just F-bombs, I'm like, you're just hitting me with a hammer all the time. That's not the right tool. Like there's other things going on. You may need, you know, a drill. You may need, you know, whatever. I'm not also in construction, as you can see, as I felt <laughs> like I knew, I knew hammer and drill and I <laughs> fell apart. <laughs> but, you know, yeah, I'm going to kind of come back to interiority there and, you know, yeah. One of the reasons I find I'm finding writing really hard at the moment is because I do a lot of editing. So I think quite analytically about what we're doing. Um, and, you know, Matt hit on this. You know, sometimes I think it's easy to forget the distinction between um, authorial narrative and narrative in character or interiority. There's an awful lot of people on that page. You know, there's there's the character, there's the there's the author, there's the reader on the page who's contributing a lot. There's the kind of the fictional author on there. There are a lot of people on there, and it gets hard to keep them straight. But um, and I, I think film and TV has undone us to some degree. Um, one of the things I, I see quite a lot, and it always brings me back to the I don't care reaction, which is why I put down <laughs> most books and, and TV shows and movies. Um, you know, I see scenes portrayed in a detached kind of camera, camera lens kind of way. And I want that visceral interiority. I'm, I'm very much modernist in that. You know, I, I want to feel what the character's feeling. Give me the gut. You know, don't just show me what's going on. That doesn't involve me. And I think that's something that, um, you know, I mean, of course, in film, you've got a director and you've got actors, you know, who are probably a lot more skilled than a lot of authors at, at, uh, at showing. Right. But I, that's a great point, actually, because... With social media and everything that happens now, right? So I think like there's a detachment, right? It's like, oh, you see something happening and you see everyone grab their phones, right? Wow, or the phone, just recording this. And I'm not related to it, right? Until the bomb explodes and it catches me, right? Like there's, the, there's that. Um, 
but there's a real there's a real detachment to where the world is just shown right and it's just whatever you see with your eyeballs um and i and i think as as writers we do ourselves we do readers of the service if we leave it at that right social media is there you don't need to compete with it but you don't you know what i mean like movies are there you don't need to compete with that there's certain uh rewards to a book and you need to express those like dig into those like what are the things from like that someone gets from a book that they're not going to get from the the great gatsby is a great example they've tried to remake it they well i should say adapt it it's never worked that's a great book you read it it's very short like anyone hasn't read it it's a very easy book to read um it's not james joyce ulysses which no one should read because it's garbage and <laughs> i think he's trolling the entire world trying to get people to <laughs> To read that might be just this guy's opinion, but um, but I think I think that's a real thing. Is that like, oh, there can be the I'm just trying to show what happened, but then there's the the getting to the bleeding heart of the matter, right? And how what it actually happened to those people there. Um, I, I think that's that's important. Um, I also think that generally telling can be a place where you flex some of your like writing like muscle oh yeah right yeah so it's like oh i went it like so tokian did this a ton like and i i actually struggled um with tokian some of the lord of the rings because um he gets very into it and sometimes i do get like the mountains i'm like it's a little too much um but when you want to when that's important when setting that stage is important to get the actors out there that are going now going to say the things and do the actions that can be really important. And that can be a, a point where if you're a poet or if you're like a really talented writer, you can really set the stage. And that, that can be really enjoying to read, right? We love, we love to read poetry. We love to think, read things and see things beautifully illustrated. Um, so I always think like when, when they, when they do that, it's like, no, don't waste everyone's time. Everything's information mm -hmm. management, but all life in some ways is information management. But how do you yeah. get to that point to where it's okay? I've set the stage. Now we're going to let Frodo and you know the hobbits. I, I just blanked on their names. I know Frodo and hobbits and Gandalf. I, I know no, you're right. Yeah, I, th yeah. I think the same thing. It's kind of like uh, when we say show don't tell. It gives the impression a little bit that. Um, telling is super easy and really like telling is a very difficult skill. So yeah. sometimes when I teach writing and we talk show, don't tell and that kind of thing, I will often have students grab a highlighter of two colors and we'll kind of look at where it's showing and where telling is and just mm -hmm. highlight. And you go, Oh, like, how do you tell? Because it's a skill that nobody teaches you how to do. Um, there's just like this vague thing on the side of a paper when you're 10th grade, you know, they say show, don't tell. It seems like so <laughs> it's right. funny because show don't tell is actually tell, right? It's like you're right. telling me to <laughs> it's like yes, exactly, exactly. You know, it's like we yeah. we need to tell many times. So uh, right. I I said that once to my English teacher and she did not enjoy that in high school. <laughs> but I was just trying to be funny. I did not mean it as a like a, a mean thing to her at all, but she was not <laughs> Yep. I love that. I actually have one of my uh, on the main shows. I have one of my one. There, there's one English teacher I have in junior college that I always yeah. loved. Everyone else hated, but I always mm -hmm. loved him. He's going to be on the show, but oh, cool. he would appreciate that. I'll have to show him. This. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. That is awesome. But I, but I think of it too, right? Because they'll be like, don't start a scene with the weather. Yeah. Because right? it's it's not a dark and stormy night, right? Because it's a cliche. Sure. And I get it. But then I think of the Grapes of Wrath, which to me, like, that's how I, when I think of the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl and everything. Yeah. That's, yeah. I, those are the, that's how I relate it. This is from that scene Steinbeck painted. From yeah. That book. No, Steinbeck painted. Yeah. That's and it starts with the Dust Bowl. Yeah, it's it's a little yeah. bit of a film thing too, you know, like the uh, establishing shot mm. is right. something 
I think that is sometimes helpful to drop a reader into a story. Um, sure. Like starting stories with dialogue. Sometimes I see that a lot and I've done it sparingly, but it sometimes is a little weird. You know, it's like sometimes two sentences before with, you know, Jim entered the coffee shop and sat down next to me. I was looking for you outside. I'm already a little bit more at ease and less confused than if you start there, like just with sometimes they always, you know, people start with dialogue or they try to take that all the way. I'm okay with a sentence of weather, you know, if it helps kind of start that establishing shot because we're really coming in and immersing ourselves into the world. Yeah. So all writing rules are like interesting start points and I think they're valid in some regard, but it's always like dangerous to follow. I don't know one writer who follows them. You know, you know that, that's exactly right. And that, you know, Neil Gaiman's rule eight, that's what he says in rule eight. Um, Neil Gaiman's rule eight says when it comes to writing, I don't think there are any rules, at least none that matter. Mm-hmm. And and that's true. It's, you know, I don't think anybody knows how, how a book gets written. Um, yes. And some people, you know, we, we come to the, the craft with different degrees of, of ability and understanding. But so we, we need some kind of guidelines, yeah. but not a lot, you know, and, and right. some of them are dangerous, open with action. And I'm, you know, I'm not going to go off onto a long sidebar, but it's incredibly dangerous, especially in the hands of young males writing fantasy. Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Open so, with action and never close. Yeah. <laughs> action, I, action, action, action. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and the book right. is 6,000 pages yeah. long. Of now. course. Yeah. And I still don't care <laughs> about the crowd. No, yeah. And you don't care because you don't know anything. Yeah. You actually never went inside the human soul, you know? Yeah. Fighting right. a dragon, but you don't know who's fighting the dragon. And yeah, right. I hear you. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I think that's great. I think there's also the. There, there's two scenes in every book and maybe I'm simplifying, but there's the actual, there's the physical scene and then there's the emotional setting, right? So we have two settings. I've, this is physically where this is happening. This is emotionally where it's happening. And when you start a story of any kind without one of those, it does leave the reader. Like, so you start with dialogue. I'm always starting with dialogue. I always start with action. That might be okay, but that dialogue or action actually needs to start setting that because otherwise I don't know where I am. I'm not buoyed. I'm lost. So um, I, I think that's a great way. And I love how you have you uh, described it, Daria, with the uh, interiority, right? There's the, you know, there's the, yeah. to me the, the emotional setting, like what's happening. I yeah. might be thinking stuff, right? And what I always, what I always think when I'm when I'm writing this, I could be. Um, I could have a character that is emotionally having a very impactful thing. There's a lot going on. Yeah. And then when I think of it, like show, don't tell. Um, and I don't, you know, I, rules are guidelines and you, you should break them as you want. Right. Just know them, like know what's happening. So, you know, when you're breaking them. Right. Um, but I think of it as like, okay, if I have someone that's emotional setting is leading to an epiphany or to lead into something important, that's when I want them to express it. So if it's, you know, Mary was, you know, she's having a bad day. The dishes aren't done. She's there. Those, the, all of these things are coming up. And then she sits down at dinner. And then what all that leads to is telling her husband, I don't love you anymore. I want to dramatize the, I don't nice. love you anymore moment. Right. That, that's the moment. There's, there's, this is the crux that I want oh, you right. to get to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's yeah, how I tend to think of it. Um, anything else before we move away from our favorite, uh, <laughs> writing rule here, show, don't tell. So characters based on people, you know, in your life. So mm-hmm. how do you manage characters based on real people, um, fiction or nonfiction? Um, and, you know, specifically, I'm thinking like sensitive subject matter, potentially painting someone in, in not so positive of a light, maybe not necessarily a negative, just maybe a light that that, that they wouldn't enjoy. 
Um, how do you manage those real world relationships with keeping your writing bold, honest, um, you know, and true? Mm-hmm. So um, we started with Dan last time. So Dario, maybe we can start with you this time. You know, I always like it when I hear writers or people teaching writing talk about honesty and truth. Um, John Gardner has a whole chapter on it in his his book. Um, it's important, and it's a it's a good question. I I mean, I've kind of come across this. I think first of all, you're going to run it through a blender if you possibly can you know, to the point where it's barely recognizable, or at least you can't get sued or, you know, lose a friendship. <laughs> um, you know, Bill, that my my first and really only very successful book was a, a memoir of a year I spent in Greece. And um, thank goodness for the First Amendment, you know, um, <laughs> which is very, <laughs> very robust. Um, because right. some some people didn't like my um, reporting exactly what was said, but that was a memoir. In fiction, um, you know, we we all draw upon reality. We all draw upon characters we know. I guess, you know, I've never been in the position of really wanting to write about a very difficult incident or aspect of someone. Um, I mean, I guess you could ask them if you minded putting it into fiction, but bottom line is, you know, if it's going to really hurt someone or screw up a friendship, I'd steer clear of it. Um, but generally, you know, you can you can run through things through a blender enough that they they lose their um association. Sure. That makes sense. I think um and you mentioned there maybe asking. Right. And I think and I and I know other authors that have done that. Right. Like, so mm-hmm. I'm, I'm writing this. Can you read it and then tell me what you think? Right. Um, and, and I always wonder about that is that. You probably need to, one, express how much leeway do you have, like how much veto power? <laughs> right? Like the government, like, okay, I'm going to run this law up to you. How much? Like. <laughs> You're the commander in chief and you just veto this, or is it something that like um that I, I think I need to keep, you know? And so um when I was um and this is actually how Dario and I met. Discontinuity, uh, right? Discontinuity. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Oh well, no, 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 just not 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 that one in particular. That one's utterly fictionalized, but we met when I was um redoing the novel that that started life as the hordes of torment. I had a horrible publishing experience. Um, and this has to be a, a topic for one of these open bars, but um, <laughs> not, not today's, but horrible publishing <laughs> experience with a traditional yeah. publisher. Um, years later, you know, I'm like, okay, this, and I, I'd met multiple other writers that they had worse experiences um, even than I did. Um, so I reached out and said, Hey, can I just have this? the book back you know it's no harm done we'll just i'll call it a day can just say you're good with me having the rights and i'll and i'll, I'll go my pleasant way they said yeah you know i also may have threatened you know, a little bit you know but um but they they gave me the thumbs up and so when i when i redid it it, it worked out fairly well because it started off um Fairy, and we'll see if I can hit this word because it is the word that challenges my vocabulary more than others. Autobiographical. Um, I always want to say audio biographical because I think I'm musical. Um, and uh, but so when when I got it back, and then I then I really went through. But the whole novel, um, which is now but the ripping apart, um, started with the with a real world thing that when Claire and I might now wife um were dating she had a teacher and she asked me hey can you come and we were friends for a long time and so we're dating but this is very early dating and so probably did it more just as my friend it was like we do you mind checking in on her right because it was this is not a date activity right and and we went and the lady was a hoarder and and out an alcoholic and and was struggling um and had and the reason she wanted to go check on her was because ironically she had 
phone book stacked um, in the living room. And she lost her phone when one of them collapsed. So when Clara tried to call her, she couldn't get a hold of her because her phone was just off the hook, right? And and anyone that just knows cell phones, no, it doesn't just go to to voicemail. Back in the day, it just went beep, 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 beep. And you're like, what the hell's happening? Like, I can't get these people. Um, And when she first read that book, um, I, because they hadn't run it by her, because I had fictionalized so much to where the character that um, Erica, that would be the stand in for my wife, like does not like in any way, like she's so fictionalized. That is not my wife. And I don't think I could actually capture a, a real human in all their complexity, just in my writing. And because we're not stagnant. So when you write, it's necessarily stagnant. But when she read it, she did start having a lot of questions about what was real, what really happened, this and that. And and it did feel like I had like I was like, oh, I, I didn't manage this well. And it was one of my takeaways is I didn't manage this well because she saw it. Yeah. And thought something way more, way different than what I intended. You know. Yeah. So Matt, Dan, you guys have any any experience with that or any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think the the blender, I've never heard that before. I think it's a genius. A way of phrasing it you know like to kind of muck it up a little bit um yeah i've you know as a fiction writer primarily i obviously write poetry kids books but it's all kind mm-hmm. of fictionalized right um i've written a few essays but never anything always i tend to write like happier essays about how my parents met because they have this fascinating story or about a funny date so i never have any fear that the person isn't going to like it it's actually a pretty like flattering piece um, but I have had that with fiction a little bit like you with, but the ripping apart, it's, it's kind of, I, I sometimes I switch it up so much. Like you were saying, I obviously named, um, location, yeah. uh, physical features. I even do gender many times. If like gender isn't that nice. important to the story, yeah. um, I switch it up. I was going through like a really devastating period of grief at one in my like early twenties or I had lost a bunch of people who really mattered to me kind of in succession. And I ended up writing Los Angeles, my first book, LOSS, because it was bound by the city I grew up in and the theme of loss. But I remember even some of those painful stories that happened to me, I was just like, oh, I'm too close to this. So if I switch this like 28 year old man to a 15 year old girl who also loses someone that really matters, how does that change the grief? It really doesn't. Um, but now I can write from just like a little bit more of a fictionalized place and I'm not sure. trying to like remember all the details that were impactful to me and things like that. So yeah, kind of like, you know, looking at all the physical characteristics down the line and seeing like what you can tweak and like how much you can kind of dial them up. Right. Like if, right. you know, if does this person need to be a 42 year old man, if this person's a 22 year old woman just going to grad school or something, does that change your story? If it really doesn't for fiction, then I think you're like, you're golden, right? Mm-hmm. Um, someone will sometimes tell you a plot. I've had a friend tell me like an interesting plot or something that happened to her parents once. I was like, oh, I, I need to write about that. But I obviously want to protect my friend. So we change everything, you know. But but you're right. saying the core truth is there under the changes. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I think I love the it. core truth and the meaning of the story, the power of the story is still very much there. Yeah, that's what's essential. Sure. Well, and that might be a great question of, is it worth telling? Right? Like, does it have that core truth? Like, can I just change this to whatever it is? You know, being male, male, what, like, can I change a few details in the the primary story? Is that still worth it, you know, worth telling? Yeah, it's the advantage of fiction, right? Like, if you're writing a memoir, the idea is you're going in and you're kind of doing some truth telling but with fiction (laughs) yeah yeah Yeah. well and i think that like everything doesn't have to be a memoir right i i I think there's too much memoir it was like i i know 50 percent of the audience just tuned out and was like i had my memoir this son (laughs) of a but and and dario i loved yours um uh, a g and dream I, i think it was really brilliant but you know just because it happened doesn't mean it's story. 
Um, yeah. So there might be things that like that happen that you, that are a story, and then can you fictionalize those, or even if it's a memoir, like you know, um, but how do how do you handle those um, mm-hmm. in a way that is a story? How do you tell a story of, based on what happens? Dan, do you want to? You have any I, any thoughts you want to take it from there? I mean, I would. Uh, I I think uh, I I would just kind of reiterate, you know, ditto and uh, two thumbs up to to what <laughs> Dario and Matt said and you uh, the, uh, I love the phrase uh, run things through the blender, through a blender. And uh, that's, uh, you know, had, had ever thought of things quite in those terms, but that's um, when I've written uh, nonfiction, uh, I do uh, do write about uh, some uncomfortable things and, and uh, people who, sure who are close that that is one strategy that I have used for distance. Uh, another, uh, frankly, um, I wait till people die and that's, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's you, know, it. Not, you can do maybe, that cause you're young. Yeah. yeah it's, uh, <laughs> maybe, you know, or so, kill, but them. yeah, or, or murder them. Hey, and then kill you, them. Then you've got, true. A, All kinds you've got of a core truth there. Yeah. And you've got a real story <laughs> that yeah, you provide your own show and, is and your ending for everyone, is taken you know? care of. Yeah. Yes. You've got everything all at once, but yeah. <laughs> it's, so if, you know, if I'm hanging out in your driveway and you're not feeling well and I've got my pad and paper, you know, uh, trouble's coming. <laughs> but it it does kind of, uh, you know, it, it it makes it easier, you know, with it, when people are, are not there uh, once they're gone uh, to write about the and, and the dead. But it it is, you know, even still, you do want to kind of, you know, keep things uh even with uncomfortable things, keep I, I try to keep some kind of uh, balance, and and I do think about how they would. I try to imagine how they would perceive that, and sure. while while still you know keeping the core truth or telling the um, the hard keeping the hard details intact, the real details. Um, you know, I true I do try to nuance things and try to you know give give some uh at least some uh sense of their side of things of why they might have behaved that way but uh sure. well and, and i think yeah. that's important is that um even in my fiction like in it, this, this goes back but i tend to i don't think of characters as the antagonist and the protagonist right like i think of we're all the yeah. same like I'm, I'm the antagonist. Like my kids would tell you, I'm the antagonist in their story, and I would be like the protagonist and the noble father trying to yes. like parent to these ruffians <laughs> into into adulthood. Yeah. Um, but I think when you're writing about someone, um, especially like even if they passed, right? Like if you try to, if you take that moment, you take that beat, and go, how did they see this? Yeah. It can actually enrich your storytelling that much more. Absolutely. Right. So if it's like, oh, my dad passed, I'm going to tell the story. Well, if you take a second and go, well, well, I wonder how he thought about this, like coming from his background, from the society he was born into, right? We yeah. love to go for the modern, modern audience, right? Yeah. They're all for modern audiences. If whatever he did was for a modern audience, like it, yeah. modern audiences, no one and everyone all at the same, right? Like it's just whoever's alive at that moment. Yeah. Um, and it, it it makes sense when you think about it and you go, oh, well, you know what? They they thought of this differently. But maybe yeah. I can I can and, incorporate that into it so that it doesn't just seem like they're a horrible person. It seems like they're from a different time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's it, it that that imaginative uh empathy is is crucial for the for the writer to have. And and Absolutely. it's also uh you know. Dario was talking about the reader on the page too. That's that right. also gets the reader involved, and they need to have that as well, and evokes that. Sure, yeah. empathy. Yeah. Is the word. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, I think again, it's uh, I think again, it's John Gardner. I, I think there are only two writing books other than mine. Um, one of them is Stephen King's Little on Writing, and the other is John Gardner's The Art of Fiction. And Gardner talks about sterility when the writer can't empathize or feel the emotion or be compassionate. 
And it's a really good word. You know, it's kind of em emotion yeah. sterility. You're right. No, that, that's lovely. Because I, I, I think of it, and uh, Dario, we've talked about this before, but I always think of it as if when I'm writing something, I don't feel like I've bled for it. Um, and, and I don't mean that literally, right? Not that I'm literally bleeding, but I mean that emotionally, right? Not figuratively, emotionally. Okay. Like if I have not bled for that thing, like I, I think but the ripping apart is probably from a craft point of view, my um, worst work, right? Is my first novel. Um, I wrote tons of short stories, probably craft wise, not on the par as a lot of my short stories and things, but I have a lead for that. Um, and I think it comes out even now. There's yes. there's moments that I think just really shine, that really capture a scene, a motion, a, a person, a time um, as it happened in all its you know, bloody glory. Um, and I think when you when you bring up other people, that becomes hard because I'm willing to sacrifice that. But I don't want to sacrifice my wife for that, right? There's an altar I'm on as a writer. I can sacrifice and I get to choose how much I sacrifice, right? Like, I'm like, I'll bleed, but I'm not giving up the ghost. <laughs> like, but... How much I don't want I don't want my wife to bleed. I don't want my my mom or my dad to bleed, right? So when I, I write things like I wrote um the uh the Christmas uh satirical anthology I was of just Fire thinking for of that. <laughs> and the first story is very like the action in that story happened. Everything else did not happen. Um but oh, my mom's kind of a crazy person. My dad's the hillbilly. My dad's actually not even. My mom's more of a hillbilly than my dad was. But, um, but they become just farcical characters. I don't worry about. It. They're, they're not bleeding. I hope they would never think like that was actually them because it's silly and it, it's satirical for a reason. Um, but when when you're writing it, it's I don't I don't want to then subject my wife to feeling like she had to bleed for something that I did. Um, and mm -hmm. that, that that's the, that's the hard part about it. So I, I, I love your idea, Dario throwing in a blender of, um, I think there is letting people read things and um, being careful about how much kind of veto power, you know, they have with it. But um, I don't know that there's a right answer, but I think it's a fascinating question. Um, before we move on, Matt, Daniel, Dario, anyone else have any final thoughts? I think that's good. Yeah. I, I think if we you solved thought that it. was good, Matt, I believe. It. I, I think we <laughs> solved You're right. Yes. Dan. We <laughs> solved this. Yeah. We did. So moving on to our pop culture question, artificial <laughs> intelligence, which is the <laughs> best. I think everyone can agree artificial intelligence is the best thing that's ever happened to a humanity because are just <laughs> our general intelligence is fading and we need something artificial to step in for us um so regarding artificial intelligence what impact do you think it'll have or i mean realistically is having um it's not that will have it's literally happening now um is having on writing and would you ever use it so um i think matt we're on you to start us yeah i might have a quite short and stark take on this, but I am okay. anti-artificial intelligence and I will not use it. And I think robots should be used for robotic things, not expressions of art. Um, I'm kind of stunned. Um, I mean, first of all, it's, it's like amazing software, which is frightening, right? Because I did have a student like turn in a paper, but he told me and it was the way he said like, oh, look what I did, you know, and he, it was like, oh, my God, it's pretty good. So it's terrifying. Um, sure. And I'm sure it's only going to get better because the speeds of these processors and all that, all technology seems to grow at like an alarming. It's like the exact opposite of politics, you know, politics. <laughs> were like still we're like debating something like, oh, how do you feel yeah. about like, you know, this issue that we passed in 1950? Well, especially American politics, right? Yeah, yeah it's grandstanding I mean, like, more. Than... I'm, I'm, working, I'm like, I'm turning 40 this year. I feel like. 
uh, we have the same issues. When I was like 15, my parents were talking about the, I'm like, why, why can't we just move like forward? You know? <laughs> The technology seems to just blast forward. Like you're, you pick up a phone from 1996. You're like, what is this garbage? You know? Um, yeah. So, <laughs> but it, it's like alarming. It's disturbing. I'm kind of amazed. There's like literary journals that are doing like author in conjunction or collaboration uh, with AI. And, and are they? Like, yeah. I've seen this a few I times. Seen that. I find it like mm -hmm. deeply upsetting, you know, like I didn't, say it in the facebook thread but i saw it and was just like hmm i won't be submitting there anymore i forgot the name but wow yeah i was just like that that's we have to be kind of wholly on one side here and there's a lot of good that can come with robots and doing stuff but as far as art screenplay and we got to right. keep this like it's true it might be an antiquated art form right like technology you could replace me and probably write books and okay and robot matthew might be amazing hmm. but we have to just kind of draw the line and just say hey you know um this is not a human soul you were talking about bleeding for your work that's what it's all about you know and hmm. that can never be replaced it's you know this is an expression i think of the lasco caves in france where it's like seventeen thousand years ago you have humanity that had these very basic needs of food shelter water and yet they found time to put these etchings on the walls in their caves and sure. <laughs> we don't really know what they were for people some people think it was to track seasons or hunting but there's a lot of people that seem to believe it was storytelling and it was storytelling it's mm. like if it is story, I, I, can, I can give the definitive action yeah. uh, <laughs> there you go well, they I, think I, it was. I don't telling. believe for a second it was all tracking this. No, it's it, true because if it was we're humans, we're into art. Like, yeah, yeah, they wouldn't have spent all the time like drawing what a buffalo looked like or whatever it was, you know. Um, right. So you figure, well, there's probably storytelling is a fundamental human need, and it needs to be absolutely treasured. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. No, I agree with you completely. I think it's fundamental. I think I think when they do that, I actually think it's silly. That's yeah. why I, I joke and say I have the answer, right? I don't have the definitive answers, obviously, because no one does. But would you, if you're living at that time, oh, I need to track the buffalo. I'm going to paint stuff on a wall. I no, agree. that's your life. Right. You track the yeah. buffalo. Yeah. Like, you, you track the buffalo the by wall. putting a rock in an area and being like, all right, we got one. You know, you don't <laughs> spend all day combining colors because it's hard to paint then. Yeah. There's no paint store. Yeah. There's no, yeah, I'm with you. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. I, I I like what you said. What what I tend to think with, with AI too is that there's the it's amazing to some degree. I actually have so here, I'll give I'll give a few of my anti examples here that I, I pulled up for the show, right? Is one is there was an article, where was this article from? Um I think it was the Business Insider. Um, and there's there's multiple of it. That's just a random one that is free on the internet, and I can I can link it up with the show. That all of the current AI, the generative AI, within like a couple generations, like two, three, like not far, without input of new human made work, is going to turn to garbage. They're actually worried about this. You know, chat GPT, all of them are worried about the fact that like, no, if it just makes it based on itself, it's going to turn to garbage. Um, and so it still requires human input to do it. And that human input is extremely exploitive, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think like my writing has probably not been used to train, you know, maybe, maybe because all of our writing is out in the public space. Maybe some of yeah, it you can actually, you can there. check there's a site now. Yeah. Right. But if you're um, John Grisham, who's one of the people suing them, um, I think Stephen King is on that list. New like York a lot Times of these writers. Well. Mm -hmm. Right. New York times. Yeah, you're right. Like Jeez. you are, taking a lot of real humans work and not giving them any um uh kickback for it you're not giving them any choice in the matter so it, it the whole software is extremely exploitive right now and taking and exploitive and utterly dependent 
on humans to feed back into it because it's going to turn into garbage. And I think it's hilarious to a degree because it's like, oh, you're gonna, you know, I, I'm going to go to Chat GPT. I'm going to make the next great, great American novel, right? Well, if there hasn't been any great American novels in the last, you know, the last ten years, yes. you're going to make the next American garbage, yeah, <laughs> because it's garbage in, garbage out, like is how the system works. So, yeah, um, Dan, Dario, you guys have any any more thoughts? Yeah, Dan, did you want to go first? I I was it. it thank you. I, I'll just agree uh, it with that uh, with all that that has been said, which might not be surprising coming from you know from this crowd. But I I just uh, I I think you know for one thing uh, I'm, I would personally would never use uh, AI to write because. Uh, I'm an obsessive person and writing is my obsession and I've got to do it. You know, I've got to write. Uh, and so that's, you know, I don't want a machine to do this for me. This is, you know, this is part, it really is part of my identity and part of, uh, part of who I am. But I think what, what Matt said, I mean, this is AI maybe can replicate intelligence, the mind, the human mind for a time, uh, but it does take human input to to determine that in in human value you know what what counts as brilliance what counts as garbage uh but it it's got nothing to do with the soul and and i, I believe in the the human soul and that's you know that's about emotions and it's about even shadow and darkness and all that's you know that's not anywhere to be found there and that's what we do as writers you know that's our yeah. that that's arguably uh our main territory to go with the the mind so this just it, it seems just kind of pointless to me to even to even try this because that's not um it, it's it's a it's it's a useless thing to try to short circuit that a profound act of creativity, human creativity, and hu human empathy, as we were talking before, uh, in inhabiting other voices and other uh, characters. That you know, this is hey, no thumbs down, two thumbs down on AI. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Well, and I, and I think there is the AI will never bleed, right? It may yeah, know like, more about yeah. like leaking code because it's not even like a proper robot. It's not even going to leak oil, you know, may yeah. leak code. It may leak ones and zeros and yeah. we may never know what it means to leak ones and zeros like the AI. Um, but it's not going to believe it. it doesn't have a soul. It doesn't know what the, all of all of those things. Um, so the idea that it's ever going to replace that, I think, is a little misguided. I do understand, though. Um, yeah two things one is if you're a writer of cozy mysteries right or insert x insert x right uh, that that's a writer that is the i regurgitate like it's a a niche genre mm -hmm. and it's i i'm writing the next harry potter this harry potter's in spain broiler point like our boiler uh plate you you might be in trouble because if you just, if you're talking generative, it's going to be better at, at generating next thriller of these, these paint by numbers yeah. than the, a human the paint, can. You can see why, why corporation publishing corporations would be very interested in this. Cause they don't, they don't need a, uh, they, they can cut out the writer potentially. And we, and I think it is, I believe they're, they're, can be an endpoint where that where the garbage will start uh, coming in, but sure. you know for for a while you could go with just kind of replicating the same old with you know romance novels or legal thrillers that are kind of you know sure. my, not particularly deep that the big you know, examples it, yeah it it could go on for a while and and you could see where yeah that's that's it's going to be exploited but mm -hmm. you know it right. just seems very hollow. <laughs> Right. Well, especially, and, and what I worry about is the who has control of it, right? It's that mm -hmm. if you're the 
the authors, you have control of whether you use it or not. But if it's like, so Sports Illustrated, which we're all of the age actually that probably knows Sports Il- you know, yes. Illustrated from when it actually mattered, right? And Sports Illustrated, like if you were on the cover, yeah. like, oh, Michael Jordan's on the cover. Oh, so yeah. awesome, you know? And the swimsuit edition is where all yeah. guys, I, I, I still have them bookmarked, <laughs> you know? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> February, um, <laughs> every February, I would look great anticipation. Every February, you're yes. right. Yeah. Yes, warm up the winter. <laughs> right, <laughs> but but they had so Sports Illustrated. Um, they used AI writers, headshots, and stories. Right, so I'm. A, I have to go a month or two ago. Yeah, it was yeah. a bit of a scandal. It broke. Yeah, the scandal broke. One of my my favorite. I, I took a, a quick clip. From one of them was that they had one of their writers um, and they've admitted now this was all AI because they had they had AI headshots, AI biographies, and then AI stories. And this one was about volleyball and the dis- genius corporate overlord AI um, says here, volleyball can be a little tricky to get into, especially without an actual ball to practice with. <laughs> And corporate overlords, like, thank you for that. You're just as foolish and nonsensical (laughs) as our former overlords. You know, we're used to be some really wonderful writing, Sports Illustrated. I mean, that was probably one of my first ideas of being a writer was being like 12 and I didn't want to read anything. And all of a sudden that comes and you go, well, maybe I'll read this piece on Michael Jordan or whatever, you know? And then you're like, that was actually pretty good. Why can't I read for school? You know, what's wrong with me? And then you're just, so it was like, so it came with some, who was the guy at the end of the, of uh, sports bill, something. Oh, Bill Simmons. I think Simmons had Simmons, but maybe he was there for a while. There was a guy I was like obsessed with who always wrote like the in closing. Right at the end. Yes. Yeah. I don't know if his name was I've Rick. Lost yeah. his name. We should look yeah, that up. Yeah, me too. Up. But yeah. I used to know it well, so well. The guy that did Weekends at Maury. Um, uh, not I Mitch, oh, Mitch not Albom. Mitch, Mitch no, Albom. I think he wrote for Sports Illustrated for a bit. Stuff, I think. Yeah, there was a guy. It'll come to me. I'll look on the yeah. phone real quick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I know what you're talking about, though. But that, yeah, yeah that wonderful yeah little short piece at the end and yep. closing right. yeah perfect and yeah yeah and that and rolling stone was another you know sure. in my formative years that another right. uh wonderful you know uh influence on on with quality uh writing and journalism so uh but you wonder you know where that's where it's where it's going to go when it gets in the hands of those big, right. uh, big well, corporate uh, entities. I think it'll collapse, but they're the short-term impacts, um, or what, or what's going to affect us writers, right? Is that there's the gatekeepers, and they're going to let it collapse because it seems cheap, um, and so I think that's that's the negative out. But the other one I saw was this is actually MSN, so Microsoft. Um, wow. Did an obituary for I actually I remember this NBA player because he was 42 when he passed away. I think this was last year. It was within the last year, certainly. Um, And the headline for the obituary for Brandon Hunter is Brandon Hunter useless at 42. (laughs) Yes, accurate. Like uh, AI bot, like he's not useful anymore, but. Not the most yes. sensitive or not the way yeah. anyone well, outside of Mother China would. But yeah. <laughs> it's, he's useful for a great non, nonfiction hit piece. You know, yeah. I can write right. about him now. I'll, I'll add him to my list. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the writer's Rick Riley. It came to Rick Riley. Oh, Rick Riley. Yeah. Okay, yeah. 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 But yeah, that's, yeah. it's great. true. It's like it's it's also weird because you were saying the same thing, Bill, about like. These writers are suing. So the software itself is just like plagiarizing work from authors, you know, learning the formula. It's got the brain that grows every five seconds. So, you know, so it can read like all of our books in three seconds. Right. So 
okay. And then it just starts to learn like, oh, this is what a sentence looks like. But, but it's only like learning the software that we give it that humans right. built. So like in a way, we're just like teaching the world's smartest student how to write. And you know what I mean? And it's like, mm -hmm. but right. it's only writing. It's probably like writing all of our sentences in some way, shape or form and right. learning plot and learning all this stuff at an alarming rate. And so, mm -hmm. you know, if it, that kind of stuff drives me crazy because it's like, okay, so now right. you're going to write a bestseller on the backs of all of us or whatever, you know, um, I think in the future too, like if this is ever going to happen, these things should just have like massive labels on them. You know, if I go into a sure. bookstore, I want there to be like a big orange sticker or something on a book that had right. any part in AI, right? Mm -hmm. um, sure. That is, yeah. But I mean, I hope we don't get to that point. Yeah. Yeah. I I don't think we're that close to it. Yeah. Um, and, and and judging by like the whole useless, that was part of the reason I, I pulled up a yeah. few of these that I had heard of them is that we're not as close as it seems. But um, you're right. I, I think the flip part is though is that it is taken away, man. Like I, I, it's it's so exploitive. Like I just I think if you wanted to use um, Chat GPT or whatever it might be to help with your chapter synopsis that you're gonna submit to an agent. Well, they're your chapters. You wanted to write it and then edit them. It's okay. Like I actually think, um, especially from my corporate career, being with the uh, uh, medical devices and you know quality regulatory stuff, I could see how using AI to analyze big sets of data could be really beneficial. So I don't think it's we don't need to throw it out, mm -hmm. but where do you use it? Like, where do we start putting those boundaries? And there was a, to your point about the putting a label on it, um, and I might have, I think I listed it here, but there was a writer that won an award yeah. um, in Japan, like a prestigious award that yeah. admitted she used, um, you know, AI to write part, you know, part of it. Yeah. Um, and to give her some credit, the story was about AI and I think from reading on it just a little bit before the show that it was it, AI was infused. And when the AI part was there, she would feed it in and then try to feed it because she said it was 95% her written. And then AI wrote those 5% and she would kind of work around it. Um, but man, I, I not to be too impassioned here, but I really think as writers as artists like it is time for us to be bold mm -hmm. to stop painting by numbers to be brave to push things to stop trying to be the i am the next harry potter in this tropes slightly turned no 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 the time for all of that passed 10 years ago the yeah. time now is for us to push forward to take risks to like to to put the human experience out there to not think, Oh, it's a three act play. No, maybe it's a five act play. Maybe it's a seven act play. Mm. Go out, be bold, be brave, be the artist, the way it was meant to be the way artists were in the past and still are today. And they're just being suppressed. And then start mm. like really pushing, like push, you know, your bookstore and your publishers give you those people, you know, Search those people out. You're on social media. You can follow Stephen King. Maybe he's a great follow. Maybe there's a hundred really worthy artists out there that are going to give you the next 50 years of great work that just aren't getting the attention now. So, um, yeah, that's what I always think with AI is like, no, 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 no. This is on us, on all humanity. Art isn't artificial right it's in there art is part of that word but it's not like art is very human um and yeah it drives me somewhat crazy um i apologize for ranting but sometimes you know it feels good that was yeah very good rant awesome so before we uh before we depart any other any other thoughts on ai or anything else i've got a lot of thoughts on it and um 
You know, I, first off, I agree with what everyone says. I agree with all of you on, on all of it pretty much, but, and I'm not trying to be the devil's advocate, but I cut my teeth as a reader on science fiction, and I've spent a lot of time reading science fiction, read a lot of it, and thought about it a lot. And first of all, I think we need to be really clear about what we mean by AI. And in this context of this discussion, we're talking about current generation generative AI. So I think there are a lot of threads to this. First of all, we're all territorial, whether we're, we're writers or illustrators. Illustrators are having a hell of a time with AI too. Worse time than writers, because it's actually better at images than it is at words, um, if you get the prompts right. But if there are so many examples in history of creatives and artisans being threatened by new technologies, you know, whether it's the printing press or photography. Photography was a huge one. Oh, my God, it's the end of art. Mm. No, it wasn't the end of art. Um, I understand that AI is different, but I, I think that it's, it's, a, it's an incremental process. You know, we're, we're at a tiny little slice of the progress of AI now. Can it reproduce the sensations and the, the visceral, emotive, somatic qualities of human experience? No. Art of, um, general purpose AI or superior AI could. We're stuck with this generative model, which is just, it's, it's, it's a pretty low-grade model. It is just building on what's out there. And let's also suggest that as writers, maybe we're all building on what's out there already anyway. Bill's talking about us making a quantum leap here and taking chances, which I agree with. Hard to do. Hard to be totally original. Um, would I use AI? I think, I think it was Matt who said, you know, or, or someone said, you know, use it to summarize or synopsis. Something like that, great idea, I agree. You know, if we had real AI, which was beyond generative and was actually, um, you know, at a more human level, which would be a whole different kind of AI, would I buy and read a book written by AI? Sure, why not? If it's good, I don't need to be territorial. Actually, I think that we, you know, using the kind of Persian carpet metaphor, we might get to a point where the human produced story is way more valuable and seen as a very special thing, you know, compared to a mass of AI generated stories. It's that way with Persian carpets or anything made by machine as opposed to things made by. So I think we have to really be honest with ourselves and, and kind of examine our souls and see how what part of it is us just being territorial and trying to define defend our corner it's kind of like you know if you find that your work is out there on the net you know usually on some pdf phishing site <laughs> yeah. i don't give a damn why do i need to be territorial about it i do know there are some big selling writers especially romance authors who are actually losing money because of that but most of the time they're phishing scams I don't have to have that visceral territorial reaction. Technology is going to progress. It's always going to be there. Um, I personally don't feel threatened, and I'm kind of I, – I, I think we just have to you know, accept that this has always been the case with technological advance. Sure. That's all I got. Yeah. No, uh, thanks for uh, um, giving the voice of the dissent. <laughs> <laughs> I would disagree, though, in, in two ways. Um, one is, so, and this happened in California fairly famously now because they like, they like to publicize it, um, 
is, hey, you know, retail theft doesn't affect anyone. Uh, good point. Good one. It affects Target. It's a multi-million. Oh, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter. But then when that starts to happen in mass, it becomes criminal rings, right? And that, that's what ended up happening. Like you saw it here in any in anywhere um that that pulled that pull that string and said, eh, it doesn't matter. Um, and you started to see where, hey, it did start to matter because it was in mass. Um AI is in mass stealing from authors. Yes. Right? That's it's in mass stealing mm -hmm. from Steinbeck and whoever, right? There's some of it's probably public domain and that's okay. Go go train it on the public domain. But King and um and whoever else, um, Grisham and uh, and all the other folks involved, um, are being stolen from, and that that's a bigger problem. Yes, um, I agree. And and that and that's not not fair with it. Um, I also I really don't, um, and, and I'm not overly religious. Like, and, and you know the story we've talked about. Like, but the idea that you can artificially train something to understand what it means to have a soul and to have like some understanding of like that understanding of what the human condition is to me is understanding what it, it is to have a spirit in you that's compelling you to do things that are a little bit beyond just um, psychology so, or, or hormones and things. So, so what if we moved beyond the, the current phase of generative AI? And the neuron, neuronal networks, you know, achieved a, you know, let's say they achieve a basic sentience, um, where they're not, where they are actually um, learning perhaps more as a human would rather than, you know, just stealing from us all. Are we okay with that? Are we okay with? Something that, apart from not having a meat body, appears to have sentience. Like the meat body, that maybe. Well, I, I mentioned it earlier. There is, if you're just making a plot, right? I'm making the next thriller, and and some people just want the. I'm going to read this thriller today, you know, and. I'm going to be done today. Give me, don't mess it up, right? I, yeah, I, I don't, I don't actually think there's any problems with that. I think it should be labeled, um, just to be clear. Yeah. Um, but it's going to do that way faster than any human ever can, um, and that doesn't require any humans anymore. If 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 you're painting by numbers all the time, well, sure, something else can go paint by the numbers better. Um, hard to. I think there's art, and then I think there's commerce. If yeah. your writing is fully commerce, which is where I'd put that, that's that's kind of what's happening. Awesome. All right. Well, I think we're good. Anything else? Anyone else wants to jump in? Great discussion. Loved it. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Wonderful. Really. Yeah. That very uh, mind expansive. Very good. I awesome. Think, uh, well, thanks so I'm much. Guys. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'd like to take all three of you down the aisle after this. <laughs> oh, you're so sweet. <laughs> oh, that, if you have really me. someone you want to take down the aisle, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, 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 my ring and size versa. is ten and a half. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on it. <laughs> thanks for tuning in. If you have a subject you'd like us to cover or something you'd like us to do a deeper dive into. Drop us a comment. We'd love to include it on a future episode. It shows labor of fun and it's truly a reward in its own right. But if you would like to support me or the other amazing authors I have on there, consider picking up a book. Any of the writers we have on here would be a great, great addition to your bookshelf. Each one is a master storyteller and just a great person to boot. So you'd be doing them and yourself a great favor and picking those up. And while I would never call myself a master because that would be, as we said in the 90s, conceited, I do have on a pretty good authority from critics and my mom alike that I'm not bad. So if you wouldn't mind picking up one of my books, that would be great as well. I would appreciate it. Thanks again for watching and thanks to my great panel of guests for coming on and, and spending this time with us. Cheers.